yeah, today I'll be uh, talking about um, what else I do and um, uh, mainly relates to my, my scientific uh, work uh, that I do as part of the, the PhD program that I'm uh, currently uh, completing. Um, and some of this work has already been published. Others, uh, other work that I'll share some about is um, still in progress and will be published soon. Um, and it all relates to sp studying the spontaneous activity in human brain organoids to better understand information processing in the brain at the circuit level. And what brain organoids are, we'll get into that. Um, and in the end, I will also link some of um, the stuff that I do with my, my research uh, to um, DAOs and online communities to make it clear why I'm also interested in that. Because at first sight, it seems like something totally different. Um, and so we'll, we'll be covering some, some neuroscience, some stem cell biology, some artificial intelligence, some network science, uh, biomimicry, and, uh, and more. Um, if you have any questions um, at the end, um, we'll have some time for, for questions. If it's really pressing, you can also interrupt me. But um, yeah, I think mainly focusing uh, for questions uh, in the end. So in my lab, we work with uh, human brain organoids. And uh, an organoid is an organ-like tissue that is grown in the lab. Um, and so it's three-dimensional. And it contains of different cell types that are all organ specific. And it's made from, from stem cells and it fully self organizes into, um, into the, the final structure. So you start with a pluripotent stem cell and it's a stem cell that can still develop into anything. And um, the, um, you give them then signaling molecules that kind of resemble the molecules it would receive um, if it would be a stem cell in a fetus that uh, develops into a certain organ. Um, and then you kind of slowly grow organ-like tissue in a dish. Um, and you can do it with all kinds of different organs. So you have like the kidney and retina and stomach and the brain and many more things. Um, and we focus on, uh, on brain organoids in, uh, in our research. And um, so growing these um, takes quite some time. Like early on, you just have some, some human uh, embryonic stem cells, and then you give them the right molecules so that they start to differentiate. And you put them in, in matri gel, which allows them to grow into 3D. And then um, after a month or two, two months, um, it's um, a couple of millimeters in diameter. So you could see this is like um, about the size of an uncooked lentil. Um, and that contains about one to two million cells some of which are neurons, but also other brain cells like astrocytes. And then when they're an age of like four to 12 months old, we do experiments on them. Um, and these are all kinds of experiments. Uh, some of them look at what types of cells there are and making some pictures of that. Uh, and others are electrophysiology recordings. And that's my main focus. And these are recordings of the neural activity that is spontaneously present in these organoids. So out of nowhere, these organoids start to send signals to each other, the neurons in these organoids, and then that's what I study. Um, here are some, some pictures, and I won't go into the details, um, but um, these are pictures um, made with fluorescent labels um, of the organoids. Ah, hi, nice that you can uh, join the call too, based out um, as a really quick um, summary of what I just mentioned in my, my last slides is that I, I work with organoids, and organoids are um, organ-like tissue that is grown in the lab from stem cells. So you take a stem cell and you give it signaling molecules um, as if it's like a fetus in, um, in um, the, um, yeah, that is being developed um, so that it turns into a specific type of organ. And uh, we make brain organoids. So I, I study uh, brain organoids. Um, so you could almost see it as mini brains, although that's not really a, an accepted term, um, that are grown in the lab. Um, and these stem cells, we just get them from, from either patients um, or from um, skin cells. Um, we don't use fetuses or something like that. And um, yeah, we, we make these brain organoids from that. And um, these are some, some pictures where we label specific cell types. So um, you see some, some astrocytes here. In, in B, you see long axons. Um, so these are part of um, a neuron. Um, and they cover like multiple hundreds of, uh, of micrometers. So they, these are really long covering one side of the organoid all the way to the other. Um, and these are also pictures of all kinds of um, subtypes of neurons, um, special interneurons to really show that these um, organoids are 
um, much more closely resembling an actual uh, brain than uh, the types of uh, cultures that people have been making so far. Um, and that's likely thanks to the fact that these can go into 3D instead of just a, a layer of cells. And so what I mainly focus on is um, electrophysiology recordings. So I mentioned that these organoids, they are spontaneously active. And so they, uh, the neurons are sending signals to each other um, without us stimulating them or giving them any inputs. And we study that. So um, here's an example of an organoid um, embedded in some, some agarose that we use to make slices. And on the sides, you see fingers to give you an idea about uh, the size of such an organoid. And we make small slices of them. We place those on um, arrays with electrodes that we can use to uh, record the activity. And these arrays are uh, super dense. So we only have like eight square millimeters of uh, sensing area. Um, so up here, you see a skill bar and this gray rectangles where we have our electrodes. But in that space, um, we have 26.4 thousand electrodes. Um, and out of that, we can sample just over a thousand simultaneously. Um, and um, you have the, the distance between the electrodes um, is only 17 and a half micrometers. And so that is about a third of the thickness of a human hair. Um, that's the distance between two different electrodes. And that allows us to measure the, um, uh, the activity of the neurons uh, with multiple electrodes. So we have um, a higher resolution than, than single neurons. And with these electrodes, we can measure uh, both the, um, the local field potential. So these are the, the brain waves. Um, for instance, in this example, you see the theta waves. And these are like the slower oscillations. But we can also measure um, the spikes. These are the action potentials. Uh, so they happen in um, like a very short, um, like uh, within um, two milliseconds, you have a spike happening. And uh, we can detect that signal as well because we have a pretty high sampling rate. Um, and let's see, go to the next slide. Oh, there we go. So this is um, an example of a little piece on um, on our array. So every line is um, one electrode, and it uh, records the signals from a few different neurons that are located. Um, and so one squiggle is uh, the signal from an action potential measured by that electrode for uh, for a neuron. Um, and it's uh, to show basically. Oh, sorry, yeah. can you repeat what a squiggle is. Oh yeah, the squiggles um, is basically these lines that, um, let me uh, mark it. So um, one of these lines in the corner. And um, so these, these types of lines, every line reflects one electrode and it uh, shows the signal from a neuron that is detected at that electrode. Um, and so every color reflects one neuron. So let's say like, this is basically the surface um, area of, of that one neuron that we detect on the array. And um, we, we can detect action potentials and, and we average basically over all of the detected action potentials to show what that looks like uh, on the array. And um, this is the type of data that we use to identify um, from which neuron uh, the action potential comes. So we wanna know not just that an action potential happens, but also which neuron it came from. And uh, there are special algorithms that um, allow you to, um, to compute that. Um, currently, what is available only um, is doing this with um, software that you can run only after you make your recording. So you first like listen what is happening and afterwards you start your analysis. And um, that is um, a major shortcoming in the field uh, because you cannot know what's happening in real time when you're actually making the recordings only afterwards. And so one of the things I focus on is uh, solving that. And this is um, like a one-step sidetrack where I basically I develop um, neural networks, like artificial neural networks to detect, first of all, these um, squiggles in, uh, in our data sets. So here's an example where just to make it a little bit harder, I, I overlapped in case there's adjacent neurons that fire at the same time. And then the neural network detects these shapes in our, um, in our data. Even the, the small one uh, right here at four milliseconds. Um, and then that feeds into another algorithm that then also detects which type of neurons um, these, um, these squiggles came from. And uh, we can do that in real time. And so it is for the first time that we can actually see the neurons firing and know which neuron it was that fired. 
in um, milliseconds after it happens. And so this is one of the, the papers that I'll be uh, yeah, publishing soonish. Um, and that allows for directly interfacing with your culture and sending it signals based on what kind of signals you're, you're reading in that moment. Um, and that gives you like a data that looks something like this, uh, where every red dot is a neuron firing an action potential. And um, in, uh, in our recording, so the, the, the rectangle is, is the, um, the data, or sorry, it's the surface of the array. And, uh, and these are the detections that we make on these uh, arrays for, for one organoids. Um, and you're going to keep in mind that this is played 100 times in slow motion. So the, the activity is, is really complex. Like um, this just happens in yeah milliseconds. All these neurons are active and, and interacting with each other. Um, you mainly see the activity on the outside, which is a feature of the organoids. That's, that's where the, the most activity is uh, present. And so... Uh, because that's where you uh, are the closest to like nutrients diffusing into the organoids. So that's where you usually find the majority of your neurons. And um, I take this data and then I do um, yeah more in-depth analyses. Another way of looking at what I just showed is um, this data represented uh, like this, where basically what I just showed was one of these uh, bursts that you see here. Um, and so here on every row, you have um, a neuron. And in this recording, there were 131 neurons detected. Um, and then um, the x-axis or the horizontal axis is time, uh, where the skill bar indicates one second. And every couple of seconds, you, you see a large burst of activity, um, which is uh, one of the things I, I focus uh, my, my analyses on. Um, and all the blue dots are individual action potentials of that neuron. Whereas the red line is um, the population rate. So basically this, the activity of all the neurons summed together. Uh, yeah, Daniel. So if I understand correctly, you basically just put your neur neurons in the gel and they start to out spontaneously fire between them? Yeah, so we, um, we put our, our organoids on the arrays and um, then um, the activity is just spontaneous. So we, we don't send in any signals, um, but the activity is, is already present um, without any incoming signals. Yeah. And um, this is in line with like some uh, a way in which people are viewing neuroscience and the functioning of the brain now, where they don't think that all the activity in the brain is a result of like external inputs that we get through our, our sensory organs. But instead, the brain is already intrinsically active. And basically, um, the activity that you see there is there to optimally process future information uh, that can come in. So basically, the brain develops in a way where it can optimally process information from the environment. And um, this is not just being empty until information comes in, but already having some kind of um, activity that is present uh, before any external information starts to reach the brain. And uh, this is one of the ways in which I'm interested in using organoids is studying what that activity could look like uh, before any information comes in. Um, and another paper that I'm finalizing is almost ready, um, looks at that. So the, the intrinsic activity to then also study what happens if you send in information. And that's why I, I needed to develop this um, <clears throat> AI algorithm that I briefly touched on earlier, because you, you want to know what is happening in the organoid in that moment and then stimulate it based on that activity to see how, how this network of, of neurons is affected by external activity. And so this is one way of looking at the data where you just look at the individual uh, spike times. Um, which is kind of like a discrete signal. Uh, you could almost see it as just interacting uh, community members where an interaction happens at a specific time point. Um, and similarly, as what we do in our um, activity analyses, um, I also compute the, the rate of activity. So this is basically using a sliding window and sliding it over the data and then um, averaging the, um, the amount of activity within that window um, to see um, an activity rate. So this is uh, the same data as um, up in uh, plot A, but in B I now um, have the rate. And so you see periods where neurons have a very high rate. So that means that they fire a lot. Uh, this is like frequency, so it hurts. 
So that's uh, on average the number of spikes per seconds that you would see during different time periods. Um, because once you have your data in a rate like this, you can do um, yeah um, some some more additional analyses on that. It makes it easier to to do computations with it, similarly to what we do with um, with our data. And um, one of these things is, for instance, looking at which activity is really similar from one burst to the next uh, versus which activity is more different. And so I separated the neur neurons in two groups. Um, the top group, their activity is very similar, um, one burst after the other. Um, so this is zoomed in uh, for four different ones, um, whereas the activity below it is more variable. And so sometimes neurons are active in this period, other times they're not. Um, and this is actually something we find in, in some other types of neural recordings as well that collaborators have made and uh, give further insight in how the brain uh, structures its spontaneous activity to optimally um, be able to process information where we kind of think that this very stable consistent activity provides somewhat of a framework uh, like a clocking mechanism um, to which other information can be encoded um, because the brain doesn't have a clock inside of it it cannot just check the time but it kind of needs to create something like that for itself and here you see basically the average over all of these bursts um, for these very consistent uh, neurons uh, on the right, um, where you see that often like the same neuron starts um, and there's some, some people that follow or some neurons that follow right after. Um, and then towards the end, other neurons are becoming active and then they're active for prolonged periods. Um, and this is always how like such a burst unfolds. Yeah, Daniel. Um, creating some sort of system to know to know time as like part of its activity is essentially loading it, let's say as an application. Um, yeah, that, that's a hypothesis is that um, the activity of these more consistent um, neurons is, is some kind of a clocking mechanism so that um, the activity of other neurons that might encode actual information from the environment once there once that starts to to come in. Um, that um, it can be happening relative to one specific time point um, that is, is being indicated by these more stable neurons um, as a way to encode information. Um, so the, it might be happening like late relative to, to this um, like recurring pattern or, or early. Um, and in that way, the, the brain can kind of keep track of uh, or en encode information about the environment. So another type of analysis that I do is uh, looking at correlations. Um, so whether one neuron is correlated in its activity uh, relative to another neuron, um, and that uh, creates these uh, kinds of um, interaction networks, where here every circle is a neuron, every node is a neuron, and every line, every edge is um, present if there is a correlation in the activity between these two neurons. Um, and so if one neuron is often really similar in its, in its activity right after another one. And um, that indicates that these are functionally connected. So we don't know if they're directly connected, like structurally connected, but they're um, in function, uh, we call them correlated, uh, functionally connected. And um, what we see here is that there are some sender nodes and some receiver nodes and some broker nodes is how we call them where some neurons are mainly outgoing. So they always start and um, the, the signal. So these will be your neurons that fire more early on in the burst, usually. And other neurons are um, always late and they're always uh, receivers. Um, and so, um, yeah, that is something that we, we now start to see in our community networks as well, but it's also present in, uh, in these brain networks. And then if we look at um, the distribution of these correlations, um, and so that's the, the extent to which two are correlated, we see that there is a skewed distribution. Um, so the majority of the connections are relatively low or medium correlations, but there is like a tail of high correlations. So a few connections between neurons are, are very correlated and they always do the same thing which um, reflects that small group of neurons that always does the same thing. 
um, whereas the majority of the neurons is more variable and they sometimes do the same thing and sometimes do something different. Um, and so, um, yeah, that is like these types of distributions, you, you come across them very often. We have one small subset that provides um, a stable skeleton or a framework um, in which some more variable activity can then exist. And I, I added, um, oh yeah, Daniel. organization design was wise or community design right like a small group that is providing the skeleton that's stable and the rest do different jobs and are flexible yeah yeah exactly um and i like that you're also thinking along those lines uh i i have some um some future slides where i touch on that a little bit as well but um basically the, the concept of network biomimicry which i'll introduce in a second um really goes into looking at networks in nature um and seeing how they are structured how they're organized and what we can learn from them in in making very efficient um yeah um people networks and um one thing i included here as well is that we we also use these organoids to look at pharmacological treatments and so we look at like treating the organoids with certain um yeah, uh, pharmacological compounds, in this case, diazepam, which is also known as Valium, um, to see how that changes the uh, the activity in the organoid. In this case, um, you see that with Valium, the, um, there are more neurons that are very similar in their activity um, than under control conditions, so that like a skeleton gets strengthened and the organoid is more consistent in its activity. And it's just an example of like what you can also do with organoids. You can test pharmacological treatments. You can test uh, disease models. Like you can make uh, genetic modifications in these organoids and see how that affects the neural activity. Um, this is still a very really early and young field because the majority of, um, or basically we're one of the first labs that, that studies this activity in organoids. Um, but there's a lot of possibilities with what you can do with them. Another place where you see these skewed distribution is the um, average rate of the organoids. And so uh, that's like how many um, spikes do they fire? How, how active are they? Um, and um, here it follows, um, yeah, you have a, a long tail with some neurons that are very active, but the majority is, is not so active um, as uh, another case where you see these skewed distributions. And um, Often the ones that are most active are also the ones that are most correlated to some other ones that are very active, uh, whereas the ones that are less active are also less correlated and, and more variable in their activity. Really highlighting the difference between one very stable um, like skeleton uh, that is very present and very correlated, and then also a lot of space for people that or neurons that come in and out with their activity. So yeah, I mentioned it a bit already, but um, from, from here, I've, I've been very interested in uh, the concept of network biomimicry. And so the, um, what I am currently working most with is uh, brain networks. But before that, I also looked at um, protein networks and ecosystem networks. Um, and um, I will get to your question in a second, Cyril. Uh, I found um, a lot of similarities in the, um, the architecture of these networks. And so I started writing about that, um, like what is similar between the ways that proteins interact with each other in a cell, that neurons interact with each other in the brain, and that species interact with each other in ecosystems. Um, and what can we learn from that to um, like improve our, our people networks? People, uh, and so I, I have two articles about that on the mirror. So in the bottom here, if you're interested in reading more about this, uh, network.mirror.xyz. The first one is uh, network biomimicry in DAOs. It kind of introduces the concept of network biomimicry. And then the second one uh, applies that and um, tells what we can learn about complexity versus stability of a network um, from ecosystems. And then also linking that to uh, online communities. Yeah, Cyril. Yeah, um, no, my, it was regarding the previous slide, um, but I don't think, uh, so basically it's, is, do you have the ability to kind of measure the lifespan of a neuron in order to see, like, to draw some type of conclusions, whether like a neuron that has been 
there for longer has a more is more active within the network um, versus a neuron that isn't active in the network does it eventually just die off yeah that's a, a great question and uh, currently within um, the capabilities in our lab we we cannot really um, measure these neurons over time because the neurons like to move and so if it's in one position on your array on one day like it doesn't mean it will be there again next week um you can do like with certain like special microscopes and, and prolonged experiments um can can see that over longer periods of time and we're currently installing one of these microscopes because we're interested in that um but in our data we we're not able to um to study this um except for some things where you we like make recordings with like a couple of hours in between them, like a few hour intervals. And then we uh, we do see that um, the consistent neurons are uh, in recording one are still very similar in their activity as in the recording afterwards. But we cannot see neurons that leave or, um, or join. Um, one thing that um, like people from other groups um, that also look into these types of questions, but not necessarily within organoids have found is that the, the neurons that develop early on in um in like during neural development these are also the neurons that are the um, the more connected ones and the more consistent ones and so um it indicates that this the stable framework the skeleton is developed first um and then later on the neurons that are more variable in their activity join um the yeah the network at a, at a later time So yeah, um, I mentioned that I um, am also writing about or interested in like what we can learn from from these types of networks um, in biology um, about people uh, networks or people constructed networks, and I'll name some ex examples. So um, one is indeed the, the varying extent of activity and the number of connections. So these uh, skewed distributions, where you have um, some people that are very active and very connected, and other people that are less active or less connected um, and maybe coming in and out of the community. Um, then another one is the varying extensive plasticity. So some neurons fire very consistently from um, one moment to the next and they, they're like more your, your stable uh, force. Um, whereas others, they, they are more variable and do something different um, and um, might be coming in and out, uh, sometimes active, sometimes not. Um, and the importance of having that stable um, like group of neurons that is being consistent um, in um, in like the other neurons being more variable. Um, having some frequent senders and some frequent receivers, um, something you see here, but also in like protein interaction networks. Um, and so some some people come up with new IDs um, and um, often initiate new ideas or projects or um, yeah directions um, whereas others are um, also initiating sometimes but um, also more often being called in uh, yeah uh, in these types of interactions um, and moderate fragmentation um, small worldness um, we cannot really see it well here because we are not plotting all the connections in this uh, this figure but um, if you do a clustering analysis, you, you do see that um, there, there are some local clusters, but that these clusters are connected to each other as well. Um, and so um, these are um, moderate amounts of fragmentation. The network was not um, sampled complete enough to study whether this net was a small world network, but other brain networks are just like uh, protein networks and um, ecosystem networks. Um, and so these are just some examples of what like you can find in nature on all different like layers of, of complexity whether you're looking at a single cell or a whole ecosystem um and um yeah they have been a big inspiration for me to think about what is healthy for uh, communities and um yeah which is reflected in, in some of our our metrics and so yeah if you want to read more about that or learn more about that either reach out to me or uh, check out what i've uh, put on mirror and um, yeah, those were uh, the, the slides that I prepared for today. Uh, I already got some questions along the way, but if there's any more questions, then uh, this is a, a great time to, to ask them.
I, I have a question with regards to how we're using this within um, Together Crew, and mainly, um, are we using these kind of, I would say, like visions when we're discussing with um, potential funders and things like this, um, saying, you know, this is um, where we want to take this. Yeah. So um, in our conceptual framework, um, which we wrote right after I um, finished the second article, um, and it's kind of like when I, a little side note, when I finished the second article, um, Daniel happened to find it on Mirror, um, and uh, that's how he reached out to me and then why I uh, joined the team here. Um, and um, the, um, yeah, so some ideas that I described there were also in, incorporated into our conceptual framework. Um, one thing that we now currently have quite present within our, um, our dashboard is the, the moderate amounts of fragmentation. Um, initially, so that, that's one of the metrics, uh, one of the health metrics that we compute for these networks. Initially, we also computed small worldness, but we found that was a little bit too hard for, for people to, to understand um, what that really means. Um, but it definitely informed us there. Also, the skewed distributions has been something I've been interested in, um, looking at the, the distributions of both the, the node degrees and the edge weights. Um, although these are also things that are a little bit too difficult to, to interpret um, by uh, community members. Like, what, what does a node degree distribution mean and how can I like take valuable insights out of that? So currently, we've, we've left that out of what we show in our um, in our dashboards, uh, but it has definitely been part of our, our thinking and like uh, played an important role in defining initial set of me metrics from which we made a selection. Um, and it is something that I would like to pick up in more detail when um, using some of our data from a few of the larger communities um, for more of an academic research project where we look closer at some of the more advanced network metrics um, and see how they uh, potentially correlate with um, more health symptoms instead of health causes um, of the community, like um, new member retention. Um, I just started a thread about that recently um, in uh, in our server to start working towards uh, doing academic research, first of all, to see how different network structures, architectures relate to um, yeah, more um, surface level health indicators or health symptoms of a community, um, but also with the interest of then seeing whether what works well for communities um, is indeed in line with what works well for, for other types of systems that we uh, find in, uh, in nature. I guess regarding the last part of your question, how we use this in our like outreach as well, when we talk with people, I, I don't think we will really mention this because a lot of the metrics that we do like show also the senders and the receivers. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's quite similar, but I don't think we're reusing this currently. Um, also maybe because it could cause some, some confusion. Are there any other uh, questions? All right. Yeah, I got quite a few already along the way. Then I'll uh, I'll stop sharing. And yeah, thank you everyone for uh, for joining and uh, showing interest. Oh yeah. Um, how? Have you studied at all, let's say, whether some of these organoids died or stopped operating altogether and are replaced by others or some something related to kind of like churn and the ongoing life of the network? Um, so I'm, I'm hearing that the, the dying of the organoids, um, when organoids die, the whole thing um, dies. And so the, there's no new um, networks that then form. Um, Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that, that is also a difficult thing to, um, to measure the, um, like the basically following single neurons because they like to, to change locations and forms. And so it's, it's hard to identify whether you're looking at the same neuron as you were looking at um, a week ago. Um, 
and so that um oh yeah <laughs> i uh, i definitely had a, a lot of issues with these uh, these neurons <laughs> and um they they it's really easy for them to die in in the brain um there's only limited places where new neurons can can grow because unlike most cells uh, most cells they undergo mitosis and so one cell can turn into two cells but uh, that's not the case for neurons uh, neurons can only be formed from stem cells uh, which is also a reason why you should be extra careful with your neurons relative to other cells in your body. Um, and um, so it's um, the, the growing of new neurons in our organoids is, is quite prevalent because we have a lot of stem cells there and it kind of like resembles a really early brain um, where there's still a lot of um, yeah stem cells present. Uh, but um, in the actual brain, you you don't see that happening as much um, neurogenesis only in certain brain areas. Yeah, it's real. Yeah, um, you 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 mentioned briefly uh, that you need to watch out for your neurons more than other types of cells. Um, and I was wondering if you could give us kind of the because I know that you work on this within the within like Alzheimer's. And I wonder if you kind of could give us some insight into maybe not just Alzheimer's, Alzheimer's but uh, health, how this, how, how you see this impacting health, um, maybe mental health and things like this. Yeah, nice. That's, I, I always like talking about this kind of stuff. And um, indeed the lab where I work, oh, I got a fancy color all of a sudden. The, the lab where I work is, um, mainly focused on neurodegenerative diseases um, and um, yeah got a lot of traction with their alzheimer work um, one of the, the leading neurogenic diseases uh, labs in the world um, and in order to um, yeah um, like some some insights i guess that that i got from working on this is first of all that the neurodegenerative diseases are best to be prevented instead of to be cured um, which is a general way i look at disease but uh, very much present here um and things you can do to prevent it um are like living a healthy life um so like not drinking alcohol no smoking uh, being active um eating healthy foods um but also keeping your brain active so like continuing to learn new things um uh, don't do the same thing for too long but um give give yourself a challenge um or even just working on some puzzles um social connections are important too so um yeah making time to connect with friends um, and, and dealing with stress. So not being exposed to stress too much. And if you are being able to let go of that stress, um, so things like meditation practices or, or yoga, um, Qigong uh, can, can be very helpful for, for these types of things too. Um, and um, yeah, there, there's no one magical pill that can take care of all of that. It's mostly a, uh, prevention through holistic health um, is the, the best way to, to treat your brain. Another question. Um, these, the, the kind of samples that you're growing, um, I already organized that. Um, are we at such a kind of um, basic level where like, we could say this is this organo organoid can be applied to the like any individual or are there like um do they come from something and so i don't know we could say like it comes from this organized comes from a person ultimately with a background with this type of ethnic background or something and so the models that we're building are only valid for this kind of sample population or something like that yeah so um the, um, the field of organoids is, is still um, really young or specific, uh, specifically like studying neural activity in organoids. Um, we do grow them in our case from, from human cells, uh, but you can also grow them from cells from uh, other animals. And uh, these human cells need to come from a donor. Um, and so in doing so, they, they reflect the, the DNA of that specific donor. And there can be differences in the DNA. So we get like also cells from um, like patients with certain diseases, like certain genetic diseases that lead to certain neurodegenerative diseases. Um, and, um, and so in those cases, the organoids really reflect um, that type of um, yeah, uh, genome. And so they, they do indeed um, like reflect a certain type of, uh, of DNA. 
Um, there has been not really many studies yet, um, or at, at all to my knowledge, uh, where they looked at organoids made from cells uh, from people with different ethnic backgrounds or um, different backgrounds like that. Um, currently, um, yeah, the field is still so young that we're comparing different ways of growing organoids. Um, and, and often not even that, but just comparing like brain organoids from humans to um, like brain slices taken from mouse pups and, um, and really um, looking at what organoids are like relative to other types of brain cultures that we are more familiar with using. And when I say very young, I mean that there have been like maybe five to 10 papers really discussing the neural activity in organoids at the most. Um, so yeah, this is really like all of these kind of things that are things that are people are interested in knowing, but um, we are not there yet. Last Hello? question. Let, yeah. I, have a, I have a last question for me and then I'll stop bothering you, which is, um, and I'm asking you because we discussed this a bit. <laughs> um, where do you see this going? The whole, the whole science and then, and also the business application of it, the medical application of it, et cetera. Yeah, um, I think this uh, this can go in many different directions, um, and I think it will will go in in multiple. Um, so, like for for one, you you can use these to do experiments that are much harder to do on like live animals, uh, which are usually the norm now to do these kinds of experiments. Um, so things like making genetic modifications or doing certain pharmacological treatments or um, making recordings with um, a resolution um, that is high enough like uh, like we do um, are all things that are really difficult uh, to do when you have an animal, um, basically a whole body attached to your organoid that can die. Um, and in organoids, it's, it's much easier to do it and um, also um, currently ethically more accepted. Um, at the same time, it also allows you to do these types of um, like experiments on human cells, so human brain cells. Um, because there are, there are certain types of um, like, yeah, diseases or um, or differences that are hard to replicate in uh, animal models. So, like for instance, making animal models of autism is really difficult, um, and these types of um, conditions can be studied in organoids as well. Um, so, I see that as as one uh, direction. Um, pharmacological treatments, um, like testing those on, on human cells. Uh, there, there's a lot of uh, interest from, from Big Pharma on utilizing organoids to uh, do large-scale screenings before, like kind of in between doing them on animals and, uh, and on actual humans. Then there's also more science fiction-y um, ideas of like seeing if we can use these organ organoids for, for computation. Um, so um, if we like send certain signals in and we get the output out, uh, can we train organoids that it does a certain computation for us? Um, and can we use that um, in, in tandem or as an alternative to artificial intelligence? I kind of like talking about organoid intelligence. Um, that is something people are interested in too. Um, you have questions around consciousness. Um, can these organoids be conscious? Uh, can they be used to study consciousness? Um, and then just more fundamental questions about the development of the brain, um, because this is the basically the only type of model that can really show you activity um, without any external inputs. Um, because when you do experiments on, on an animal um, and you want to like see how it responds to, let's say, a certain um, image that you're showing it, you always have to consider that these might also be just muscle movements that you're detecting uh, the brain signals of or um, other types of inputs that they're getting at the same time. And you really have to think about how you set up your experiments there. And here you know that there is no other activity coming in because there's simply no organs uh, connected to these, uh, like no sensory organs connected to these organoids. Um, and that allows you to also do some stimulation experiments where you stimulate certain neurons and see how that's um, like external activity that you introduce into the organoids uh, propagates into the, the rest of the network to get a better understanding about how neurons at like a circuit level process information. And that, that's one of the things that, um, yeah, I am focused on. Um, and then one other potential future use case that people are working towards, which I think is uh, pretty impressive, is um, using organoids to... Um, 
give um, like to, to to replace brain tissue that people lost. Um, so a couple of years ago already, they they showed that uh, when they took a little bit out of the brain from a mouse and they replaced that with a, a brain organoid um, from like mouse cells, um, they could actually um, detect that these brain cells were taken up into the brain network, um, like the overall brain of of that mouse. And so um, they they became the neurons became part of the um, the neural networks in in that brain. Uh, veins started growing into it, and it really like was taken up as um, as new brain tissue. Um, so you could like think of people that um, had a stroke or something like that and lost brain tissue as a result um, that could potentially be replaced. Um, or similarly to this, like um, using organoids for computation, it might be that. Um, there, there could be a future where we all have a, a second brain uh, that we're connected to through a brain machine interface or something that can just is an indirect connection with with our brain um, and gives us extra computation power in our brain. These are longer term ideas, but um, yeah, within um, multiple decades to a century, these, these might be uh, things that we uh, can really start to consider as uh, becoming a reality. Um, and so, yeah, these are also things that uh, this uh, this field might uh, might go towards. Then, oh yeah, and the last thing um, in the the latest update from Neuralink, so that is Elon Musk's uh, brain machine interface company. Uh, very interesting company, by the way. I would definitely read up on that if neuroscience is of interest to you. Um, but in their last update, they also present that they use organoids to to test their devices. Um, so that's another way in which uh, organoids are used um, to to see whether their um, yeah their neural links are working properly and how they behave in in neural tissue over prolonged periods of times. In, in this vision of um, the ability to buy. Essentially, you can go out on the market and say, I need to become, to process information faster. So I'm going to go and basically do, you're going to have Amazon, which is going to be offering organoids as infrastructure as a service. That is, so you can basically then out intelligence somebody just through your, by throwing money at the problem, essentially. In, in theory, um, that could be possible. Um, there, there will probably be a lot of obstacles along the way to, to get to that. Um, but um, I, yeah, it, it, in, in theory, it could be possible, um, especially with the brain machine interface technology that has been um, developing as well. So um, yeah, again, Neuralink is, is, is definitely one of the main players in that field. Um, they can already read quite some activity out of your brain. Um, they currently have no write ability. So they, they cannot send signals back into your brain. Um, and so that, that would be currently the main limiting factor to just outsource some, uh, some computation and get the results directly back into your brain. Um, initially, that might have to um, like happen through VR or something. But maybe in the future, they could even stimulate um, your, your brain and, and send signals directly back. Um, but again, that, that's really like the, there, there might be unforeseen um, obstacles that um, make that take a lot longer than we, we can imagine. Um, but people are definitely interested in that. And once you have that interface with the brain machine uh, interface, it's a question whether you could um, like run these things on a computer um, or whether you need more like uh, biologically inspired um, computation and you might need organoids for that. That is also an open question. So whether we can do a brain machine interface, just hook us up to AWS, for instance, and, and just run our, our queries there or uh, whether um, you need an organoid type of tissue uh, to do these kinds of things for you. It's interesting. I also see it from like a, a workforce model, right? Like today we already do that, right? Because we employ people who will think for us. But if you can just basically outsource that to, you know, some kind of organized service, it, uh, it also changes, you know, the whole workforce model. Interesting. Yeah, and then uh, GPT gets a new competitor. <laughs> yeah. All right. I think we're at the hour. So, unless any last questions, I think we need to let people go. But thank you very much for that.
super interesting. And I get it for the second time and I still am like, wow. <laughs> <laughs> I've been working on this for four years and I still feel like, wow. So <laughs> <laughs> Very cool. All right, cool. Thank you very much, Henry. Yeah, yeah, you're welcome. This was fun. And uh, thank you all for your questions.